some treats left here. I'm, I'm not sure where they came from, but please help yourself. That's some cookies back not there. Um, so I've been really excited about this last forum. It's a topic I have a lot of interest in, but don't know much about, so maybe that's mutual among all that are here. Um, the person speaking today is somebody who does so much. Um, whenever I think about how tired and busy I am, I just think of all the things that she does, and I know better. So, Laura Michetti is um, a scholar, an ethnographer, an astrologer. She's also a storyteller. She's a mother of two children. <laughs> um, PCC candidate, PhD candidate. Uh, she's also a very dear friend and assistant to CIIS's president. She does so many things. Um, so I think I'll leave it at that. <laughs> so here is Laura and the Ethical Witch. We need the flyers and chairs back there. So you can actually just sit. Make sure there's, it looks like there's one extra up front here, too. Yeah. Um, thank you all for coming. I'm so happy to see so many of my favorite people all in one room. Um, and the fact that I get to talk to you about things that are important to me uh, is really wonderful. Um, I'm actually going to start hold on, with something different first. Um, I'm going to start with a, an invocation. Um, and then I'll tell you about the invocation and where it's coming from. So just sort of listen. So, O oh sun, best and greatest to hold the middle place in the heavens, mind and moderator of the universe, leader and princeps of all who kindle forever the fires of the other stars. And you, moon, who placed in the, oh, sorry, who placed in the farthest reaches of the sky, shines with holy rays and ensures with your monthly office the continuation of human procreation, ever increased by the light of the sun. And you, Saturn, who, set in the highest point of the sky, carries the leaden light of your planet in sluggish revolution. And you, Jupiter, dweller on the Tarpeian rock, who makes the universe rejoice with your benevolent power, and who holds the rule of the second sphere. And you, Mars, Gradivus, always with your fearful red color, whose home is the third region of the sky. And you too, Venus and Mercury, faithful comrades of the sun. By virtue of the harmony of your rule, and obedient to the highest God who gives you never-ending lordship, vouchsafe that Constantine, the most great princeps, <laughs> now you know a little bit, but I guess where we are, and his unconquered children, our lords and Caesars, rule over our children and our children's children through endless ages, so that free from all misfortune, the human race may enjoy everlasting peace and prosperity. When's the last time you picked up an astrology book and that's how it started? <laughs> Um, I think that's a beautiful invocation to all of the lords and lordesses. <laughs> um, so the title of this talk is uh, The Ethical Witch, and that kind of leads us into a brief 
sort of media moment. So just watch. <laughs> that it was okay that we didn't have sound for the first couple of minutes because that should be ingrained in most of your... Thank you. You're like, here's munchkins. <laughs> okay, thank you for catching that. Um, <laughs> so I wanted to start with Dorothy. First of all, my daughter is in The Wizard of Oz currently. So the Wizard of Oz is dominating the psyche of my entire household with lots of Wizard of Oz songs. Um, and so I might have been you know, sort of subliminally um, infected. But I also wanted to start with that because there's this, the idea, right, of a good witch and bad witch. And are you a good witch and are you a bad witch? Um, and some of that is going to kind of come out and we'll address it a little bit. But more important, what I wanted to kind of capture in that moment um, is Dorothy Gale, right? She suffers a bit of a kind of traumatic loss. Um, she's suddenly like in a whirlwind storm. Um, and she awakens to find herself in a new land. Um, the new land has all manner of creatures that she doesn't know about, um, plants that she's unfamiliar with, color, a literal new perspective. And yet, even still, when Dorothy is asked if she's a good witch or a bad witch, she says, I'm not a witch at all. She still hasn't figured out that she's actually a witch because under what other circumstances do witches come to be? So I want us to just remember that, right? That witches are good and witches are bad, but just admitting that you're a witch is sometimes the hardest part. Um, and Dorothy, of course, doesn't figure it out, but, and, and I would love so much to just spend the next two hours talking about the Wizard of Oz and how Dorothy is a witch and we could go through that, but that's not what we're doing <laughs> unfortunately. Um, so, one of the things that is interesting about this in particular is that Dorothy's excuse, right, for um, <clears throat> not being a witch is that witches are old and ugly. Um, and I think it's really important to kind of pay attention to the reality that the reason why the word witch is so um, fraught with misconception um, is because we actually don't really know what it is. And the witch has been used in media, story, um, and history in a lot of really sort of bad ways. And so it's very easy to not want to be a witch or to not want to admit you're a witch. In Dorothy's case, because they're old and ugly. Um, in our case, it might be because they've been burned at the stake or because they're looked at even more contemporarily um, as sort of uh, new agey and, and boo boo. Um, whatever the case, there seems to be an issue with just sort of claiming this identity. Um, so I want to just sort of clarify a little bit of ground. Um, so who are we referring to when I use the word witch? Um, and I'm going to use it liberally in this particular context, um, specifically because I just want to talk about a lot of different things. Uh, as an astrologer, um, that's primarily where I'm sort of sitting, um, is in the field of astrology. But Witches can be herbalists, they could be psychotherapists in some circumstances. There are actual witches who are pagan priestesses or Wiccan practitioners. Um, and then the whole realm of um, sort of shamanic tradition, you could also classify them as some sort of witch. So I'm going to be generous and say that a witch can apply to a whole range of identities. Um, and although there are specific differences between astrologers and witches um, per se, I will talk about those in a few minutes. 
I'm just going to sort of say that I'm called using it witch, and I'm going to call myself witch, even though I'm mostly an astrologer. So just sort of put that out there as, as where we are. So then this sort of begs the question of um, sort of what I was talking about with, with Dorothy is like, how does one come to identify oneself as a witch? Um, where does the word witch come from? Uh, as an astrologer, I very much, for all the reasons I just sort of stated, have been opposed to really calling myself a witch. I had definitely been opposed to calling myself even an astrologer, for that matter, because both of those words, what, the moment one of them comes out in conversation, another person can so quickly assume who you are, what you do, um, and then they think they know you. And so I never, I always don't want to be known right away. And so it's easier for me to, to not sort of claim these things that um, somehow act like a scarlet letter on, on our shoulders. Um, and, and that's not the only problem, right? I mean, the word witch is actually really problematic um, in a very real sense. Uh, I'm writing my dissertation right now, and I've been reading a lot of uh, court trial records, actually, of witch trials in Europe. Um, and in, in the 15th, between the 15th to the 18th century, um, although we only have a couple thousand actual records of the trials and names of, of victims, um, it's currently estimated by scholars that probably around 50 to 60,000 people, primarily women, were burned in Europe and the New World, uh, or murdered, sorry. Some of them were burned. Um, some of them were just murdered in, in less glamorous ways um, <clears throat> on, on account of witchcraft. And, and so it really is true that being a witch is, is not glamorous, and it's sort of a dangerous thing to be. It's a dangerous thing to call oneself. Um, but, and I want to kind of insist that, that this is the perspective that, that we take, that I am going to take. In a lot of these cases, most of the people who were sort of accused of witchcraft, maybe they were witches, maybe they were just women who, maybe they were midwives, right? Maybe they were someone who delivered a baby at home. Maybe they were someone who just happened to like know herbal medicine and um, prescribed tea to somebody while they were sick and that person then didn't go to the priest. And so then there's a, a sort of um, conflict that of interest that arises. So then that person becomes a witch. So what I wanna say is that if the courts can take the label of witch and apply it to whoever they want, then we can reclaim it and say that we are witches. I think it's important for us to be able to use the words that they have actually used against people um, and reconnotate them, give them a new meaning that is a little bit more intentional and definitely with less sort of nefarious intentions. Nefarious is a word that you introduced into my vocabulary. I wouldn't usually use it otherwise. <laughs> I find myself saying it, I'm like, oh, I like that word. But <laughs> um, so if the courts can call us witches, then we can call ourselves witches. So I'm a witch, I'm an astrologer. <laughs> um, but again, like I said, there's a, a bit of a difference between astrologers and witches per se. Um, I would say specifically, astrologers have been somewhat lucky in the, in the sort of course of history and that the practice of our art looks a lot more like science, especially pre-modern world, um, than some of the other sort of practices associated with witchcraft. And so witch or astrologers have been able to kind of isolate themselves from these um, practices that were so outright prosecuted. Um, it focuses on cosmology, um, on the universe, whereas witchcraft often focuses on very earthly, tangible objects. Uh, and then there's the issue of the divine that comes in and the difference between witchhood and astrologers. Um, and basically, uh, again, sort of coming back to a lot of the um, um, court trials, one of the interesting things that comes up on, often in the material is, that, um, is a sense that demonology is always implied or implicit in any practice of witchcraft. This is the argument that the Christian church basically would have had to have craft in order to, um, in order to prosecute people. So, right, it's like, no, they're not just playing with plants, they're worshiping demons. And so because they're worshiping demons, those demons are at odds with, at odds with God, so then we can kill them. Um, so there's that demonology component in witchcraft that really didn't fully sort of um, plague astrologers. And, and that's been a gift that we have had as a sort of in between this world and the witch world, where what we do is clearly a strange thing, but it's not so obvious from the outside. Um, and so, um, and then the other thing that sort of comes into this particular piece is that this is so extreme to the extent that you can actually even remove all sense of divinity or demonology or spirit from astrology. 
um, which we saw happen in certain sort of cultures and history, um, particularly in the Persian tradition, where they, I mean, with sort of Islamic astrology, there was no, no deity sense to the planets. That, that was fully stripped so that these could be forces that were being utilized by the one powerful Allah in order to make things happen on earth, but, but they were stripped of their divine nature. And so that's another sort of asset that astrology has had that it can in fact function with or without a spiritual component. Um, I think what I was trying to get at in that invocation in the beginning and what we'll discuss a little bit more is that without the spiritual component, there are potential issues that arise. And so we'll talk about some of those. Um, so that's sort of the, the context of of where we're, what I want to come across, what I want to get across to you all. Um, in order to sort of look at uh, witchcraft and, and ethics or astrology and ethics, um, there's really sort of three areas, I think, in which we can apply ethics as a um, practicing astrologer or a witch. Um, and these would be um, in relation to the self, um, in relation to our clients, and in relation to a bigger community. Um, so I'm going to break these down and sort of talk about some ethical issues. Also, just as far as the format goes, um, we're going to look over some historical material and I'm going to discuss, but I'm also going to intentionally leave many questions in each of these subsections. And I'm hoping to generate dialogue because I really, really believe that um, it's not up to one person to determine the ethics of an entire community, right? Um, when I was in Norway uh, at the Shaman Festival in um, August, the, the whole shaman community came and sat down and had a full roundtable panel discussion about what they think are not necessarily the ethics, but sort of like the creed of their particular shamanic tradition. And the information that they shared with each other and came up with turned into a creed, and that creed went out to the larger community of people who weren't at the festival for them to comment on. And so it really is a, a dialogue. Um, and so I want that to be clear. And there's so many of us that I think we'll have plenty of time, and I, I hope that this generates discussion. So. Um, so I'm, I'm going to literally like ask a question and then not answer it. So just be prepared for that and use those as moments to think about what your responses are to that and what you would do um, with these sort of suppositions. Um, <clears throat> so I guess you could do that, huh? Yeah. <laughs> I'll just tell you next slide, please. Um, so astrology hasn't always been um, a free-for-all, let's call it. I think modern astrology is somewhat a free-for-all. There's lots of books people are writing. We're very much in this sort of postmodern tradition where everybody has something to say and every perspective is at least worth listening to, whether or not it's authentic or valid. We, we pay attention um, to these new perspectives. But it didn't used to be like that. Um, in the historical tradition, astrology was very much a sort of sacred art that was handed down like literally on a piece of paper from one person to another person. And then you had to protect that, maybe translate it into a language that you could then share with other people and then very carefully hand that off. Um, and if that document got lost, it was gone forever. Um, one of the astrologers uh, of the classical era is a man named Firmicus Maternus. Um, and he was a Roman astrologer. He wrote in Latin um, and he was uh, writing in the third century, the common era. Uh, and his main book is called The Mathesis. And The Mathesis is a, a really great, if you're interested in like old astrology, it's a very um, easy reading. Some of the ancient astrology books are very complicated and have a lot of um, technical information that can just be sort of dull. But this one's actually very interesting and it reads like a basic instruction manual of astrology. And The Mathesis starts with what is called, hold on, oh, next slide, please. <laughs> um, the life and training of an astrologer. So he goes through the invocation, he talks about a little bit other stuff, and then he says, life and training of an astrologer. This is a subsection. This is before anything is taught. This is before he mentions an ascendant. I think maybe he gives you the signs um, and the planets, but that's about it. And um, there's 15 of them. Uh, I'm going to go through a couple of them with you, and we're going to sort of use these as our basis to build dialogue into a contemporary practice of astrology and astrological ethics. Um, so just so you understand the format that I'm kind of working with. Um, so the first point um, is, now you, whoever you are, who try to read these books, since you have received the whole knowledge of this divine science and are now endowed with the secrets of the stars and have learned the first principles of the art, shape yourself in the image and likeness of divinity so that you may always be a model of excellence. He who daily speaks about the gods or with the gods must shape his mind to approach the likeness of divinity. 
um, no pressure, right? <laughs> you're just talking to God is all. <laughs> like, you just kind of have to be sort of like God if you're going to talk to God um, and comport yourself accordingly. Um, so this particular point sort of brings up um, a, a way of comporting ourselves, right? Like what kind of self-ethics do we have as astrological practitioners or as witches? Um, do we think of ourselves as communicating with the divine? Really, do you really think of that? I've been practicing astrology for 20 years, and I know that I'm communicating with something, but I don't know that I've fully sat with the reality of it being the divine. And if I did, I don't know that I would ever pull out my iPhone, right? Like, I, I mean, I you have to have a bit of a filter of like, if I'm really going to talk to God, then like I need to be in a cave or something, and, and and you know, all of these things sort of come up. And so, how do we engage with the intensity and the immensity of what we're doing, if we really believe that's what we're doing, um, while still just sort of being alive and being humans in our world. And so we'll talk about that. Maybe Turnus has some ideas. Um, but I just kind of want to bring that to the fore of, are we communicating with gods? And if we are, how are we behaving when we do that? Um, we do the next one. So then point number two. I hope you guys don't mind me reading these. Therefore, study and pursue all distinguishing marks of virtue. And when you have trained yourself in these, be easy of access, so that anyone who wishes to consult you about anything, he may approach you without fear. Be modest, upright, sober, eat little, be content with few goods, so that the shameful love of money may not defile the glory of this defining science. Try with your training and principles to outdo the training and principles of worthy priests. For it is necessary that the acolyte of the sun and the moon and the other gods, through whom all earthly things are governed, should so educate his mind always that it be proved worthy by the attestation of all mankind. That's kind of a, a little bit more of a specific list, right? Like eat little, be sober, be upright, be always available for anybody who asks you a question. The, this, the demands are, are a little bit stronger here, maybe a little bit less applicable to modern life, but maybe more necessary even to a certain extent. Um, can, we can do the next one real quick, too. And then number three, see that you give your responses publicly in a clear voice so that nothing may be asked of you, which is not allowed either to ask or to answer. And then one more. Numbers four through seven are just about don't make any comments about the emperor. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> Literally. But, like, really don't make a comment. No, but truly don't make a comment. I absolutely say no. And then, and then we move on. Okay. And so then number eight, have a wife, a home or a wife or husband, um, many sincere friends, be constantly available to the public, keep away from all quarrels, do not undertake any harmful business, do not be tempted by an increase in income, keep away from all passion and cruelty, never take pleasure in others' quarrels or capital sentences or fatal enmities, employ peaceful moderation in all your dealings with other people, avoid plots at all times, shun disturbances and violence. Um, so... Just, just bringing all of this in. Um, when I first started studying astrology uh, 18 years ago, um, I was inspired by a talk by Rick Tarnas, actually. This is, the, it, which brings me full circle here because it was a talk about ethics and astrology. I don't remember the name. Um, but it was given at NCGR, I saw some Southern California Astrology Conference um, in like 2001. And in it, he speaks about the role of astrologer as being likened to that of a priest. And I remember back then, like, I was still barely just out of sun signs, right? And to hear somebody suggest that was at once like, terrifying and also really enticing to me. And it seemed, um, number one, a very noble way to, to assume the sort of role. And also it made me feel really magical, right? Like, that's where the witch part comes in, where you're like, wait a second, there's more. There's more to this that we're doing. It's not just a horoscope column. It's not just... Um, me being a Libra, it's not even me just having a Scorpio moon, like there's a whole tradition here that, that I'm not aware of and that I want to learn about. Um, and so that I think is a really interesting way to kind of think about ourselves. And of course, Maternus here also said, you know, comport yourself as though you were a priest, train and learn as seriously. Um, and I'm not saying that that's what we should do, we'll, we'll talk about all of this, but, but I'm just sort of laying groundwork for perhaps what we could aspire to be, and maybe understand the reality of, of what we already are and whether or not we admit it to ourselves and what the implications of admitting that to ourselves are or aren't. Um, so, so these are sort of ways of ethically embodying the, the title, right, of witch or of astrologer. Um, 
And again, this is going to be stuff for us to discuss. I want to hear what you guys think about these things, being sober, eating little, not wanting money. Like, you know, these are these are really full requirements. Um, I mean, kind of, you know, like, I like a good glass of wine. So, I, I mean, we just have to really sort of think, or can we apply this here? Um, but also, so in addition to how we comport ourselves um, ethically as astrologers, there's also the, the, the part of astrology in which... Um, how do we hold compassion and how do we treat ourselves ethically as witches? So not just how do we comport ourselves in service, but how do we treat ourselves ethically? Um, how many of us astrologers have sort of looked at our own chart, right, and been radically unethical in the way that we interpret ourselves? Um, I know I've spent probably as many years as I've been studying astrology being unethical to myself in looking at a birth chart, looking at a transit, looking at whatever it is that I happen to be going through. And saying things to myself that I would never dare say to a friend or a client or anybody else. And yet it's altogether too easy to think that not only do you have some new secret wisdom of yourself beyond just being yourself, you have now some God giving you a decree about your fate or your identity. Um, but that that can also be, be really kind of mean and judgmental. Um, we often see the worst of our own charts um, when we look at them and, and we end up getting ourselves, I think, into trouble when we behave that way. Um, using ourselves as guinea pigs um, is, is like bad, <laughs> just a normal, I mean, it's better than some alternatives, but it depends on how you do it. Um, if you try and learn a new technique on yourself, you are probably not going to be an objective learner, right? Um, an objective student which then leads to potential problems like just simply failing and not being able to make an accurate interpretation of a particular experience or transit or um, natal combination, in which case then you think that that particular technique doesn't work or you don't understand it and then it can give you a sort of bad taste in your mouth. Um, and so, you know, that, that that's something to just sort of be, be cautious of. I think that the reason why we often do this is because we are so inundated with easy access to information. It's like no problem to be able to go on an internet forum and just like learn a new technique and then apply it to your life and then your entire life can crumble before you and you can have an, like months of, of, of having to like renegotiate and it wasn't even right to begin with. Or whether it was right or wrong, it doesn't matter, it harmed yourself, right? And so these are things that we need to start questioning, like, are, are we our best first, you know, trial? Um, or is our current moment, if you're going to practice on yourself, like, only look backwards, right? Don't look forward. Maybe make a, a sort of, um, an, an, like, an honor code with yourself about how you practice astrology to not do these things. Um, I think that, you know, really sort of looking backward, I've, I've talked about this before in other talks that I've given for PCC, but but looking backward is, is such a, a good way to learn astrology. If there's something that's been calling to you, some new method, some interpretation that you want to learn about, just start by looking backward and see how it's manifested in, in cycles past, because that's how we actually learn. That's how we learn to see our relationship with a particular planet, particular energy. Um, and then once you really feel like you actually have some grasp of it, then you can start to look forward, but again, with caution. Um, I think that the main rule for sort of a self ethics of astrology is if you wouldn't do or say this to a client, don't do or say it to yourself. It seems so common, and yet I do it all the time. And I'm sure anybody in here who can look at a chart and see something in it does it all the time as well. Um, so just sort of leave that out there. Um, move on now. So, what do we do with clients then? If I'm telling you to behave with yourself the way you would behave with a client, how do we behave with clients? Um, so Maternus kind of has things to say about this. He says, to erring men, especially those bound to you by ties of friendship, show the right road of life so that, trained in your principles, they will easily avoid the errors of life. Never be present at nocturnal sacrifices, whether they are held publicly or privately. Do not bring forecasts to anyone by stealth, but openly, as we have said before, and in the sight of all, exercise the discipline of this divine art. And then one more. And then point 11, in drawing up the chart, I do not wish to show, I do not wish you to show up the vices of men too clearly, but wherever you come to such a point, delay your responses with a certain modest reticence, lest you seem not only to explain, but also to approve what the evil course of the stars decrees for the man, human, individual. Um, so 
these these things bring up a couple of, of talking points. Um, is astrology a moral compass? Can we actually like use it as that? Can you look at sort of a birth chart and guide someone in right action? Do you want to go back to number 10 for me to just back one? Um, you know, uh, show them the right road of life so that they can easily avoid errors. Like that's a tall order for the average human, much less an astrologer who somebody is coming to thinking you're a priest, right? Or that you have access to the divine. I mean, if we sort of carry these, um, these messages with authenticity, um, then that's that's sort of intense. And so how do we reconcile with this? Is astrology something that is capable of carrying morality or is it decidedly outside of morality? Um, as somebody who studies divination from all around the world, divination is not necessarily moral. It's the interpreter of those, those meanings that is already sort of recognized within a community as being a sort of social and cultural core of knowledge of ethics of morality but are we that as astrologers is the average astrologer that you go on instagram or the web or um, anywhere like are, are these are our pinnacles of, of morals of morals in the modern world i'm not saying they're not i'm just asking a question and i want us to really sort of always have that question in mind um, as we sort of think about these things now one of the things that so um, can we go back to number 11. um so in drawing up the chart, I do not wish you to show too clearly the vices of men, right? Like someone's chart comes up and you're like, oh gosh, you've got, ooh, you know, or what are you going through right now? Oh, you're in your Saturn return. Oh, and all of the, the we all do it, I do it, you know? Like, and, and there's something to be said for, for finding community and to, and to reflect these things. But um, but it's an important thing to, to sort of be aware of this, like how do we handle the good, the bad, and the ugly? I'm calling it. So on the one hand, we have the sort of ancient tradition. Um, and in the ancient Greek tradition, the um, planets were divided into two identities. They were either kakopoyo or agathopoyo. Kakopoyo are bad doers. They literally do bad things to you. And agathopoyo are good doers. They literally do good things to you. And within the sort of Hellenistic astrological tradition, it was perfectly acceptable to conceive of a planet as offering up something, some experience that was qualitatively bad or qualitatively good. These are words that we shy away from in the modern world. Um, I don't necessarily think that that's an ethical practice. Um, I'm just sort of stating the reality that we would never do that, most of us. Um, but we would go, ooh, Saturn return, <laughs> which is a very different. Um, okay, so Agapapoyo, Kakopoyo, saying that these bad things are gonna happen to you, it's a little ethically questionable. It's probably not an ideal method. But then on the other hand, we have now our sort of modern approach, um, which is sort of summarized by this phrase. I'm sure other people have heard it before, but I was taught it by one of my first astrology teachers, Dimitri George, and it's called AFGE, and it's an, uh, A-F-G-E, and it means another teen growth experience. <laughs> and so you're going through something bad. Oh, I'm so sorry, but you'll grow from this. And it's the sort of habit of spiritually bypassing of trying to minimize an experience and it comes from the right place right it comes from an ethically sound place but whether or not the desired ends are actually making somebody feel more connected or more seen in their struggle is also ethically questionable and so we're sort of stuck in this middle of we don't want to overemphasize the problems but we also don't want to brush them aside and it takes a little bit of a delicate balance as an astrologer somebody who has access to this information that can be really confirming for somebody to recognize it can also be really devastating for somebody. Um, and so faith comes into this. Um, and, and these are issues that we have to contend with. And I think, you know, just to sort of pause and go on an aside, the reason why I bring all of this up is not to say that people don't, but to say that we should dialogue about it as frequently as possible. Because if you talk to somebody else who's doing something like this, who's an astrologer, they have contended with these issues, whether it be in real life or um, with their own self. And that is a good way for us to, to learn how to, to be, essentially, um, to learn what this role is and, and how to work it out. So some options that are out there to kind of bridge this, this delicate divide of bad doers and another thinking growth experience. Um, we could all be trained in psychotherapy, right? Like just astrologers, psychotherapy, that's it. You just have to be trained and know how to engage with the human being. And if you trigger them by saying Saturn's going to be on your moon for the next year, good luck with that. Then you should have a, a sort of background in being able to contain their experience. Um, 
that's not really possible though, and probably not really very fun either. So <laughs> that's my opinion. Um, so that's one option, right? Another option would be to kind of put boundaries around our role as astrologers. Um, basically to sort of limit from an external perspective who we are or what we think we can see. Um, and that's definitely one option is to just be like, I don't know. I don't see that. I don't have an answer for that. I don't know how this transit is going to manifest for you. It's the path of least resistance. It's the openness of um, the universe. All of those things are true. We don't always know how things are going to sort of turn out for people. But there is a sense in which we also have a bit of a responsibility. So in, in leaning into that responsibility, I wonder if, if maybe it's more sensible to then like highlight what we do, to inflate it to a certain extent, to almost admit it as the greatest possible power that it could be. And then what would happen if we engaged with clients from that position? Um, I think personally, and I might be speaking only for myself, but we hardly believe ourselves to be truly able to declare someone's fate, right? As modern Westerners, the concept of fate is like kind of impossible to really grasp um, because we, we are, we're just so conditioned to believe that we have alternatives. Um, but I think it could sort of do us good to think that maybe we have that power. Um, it might make us better at sort of tempering our words if we recognize them as inherently powerful just by being uttered, just by virtue of their divine origin that we are sort of channeling. Um, they have huge power. And uh, if we minimize that and we think it's, it's just astrology or I'm, I'm doing this, then, then we might be able to do damage in a way that perhaps we wouldn't if we felt the immensity of what we're doing. Uh, I don't know, to be frank, that's something for us to discuss later. So we are not flying blind here. Um, in modern astrology, there's organizations that um, train astrologers. There's um, one, the association, or sorry, the Organization for Professional Astrologers, known fondly as OPA. Um, they have a code of ethics that mostly involves the sort of typical things you would find in a kind of clinical practice of like, don't fall in love with the person you're doing reading for, and things like that. Um, don't tell people that they're going to die, you know, just like basic ethical sort of guidelines. They also have an astrologer's oath, and I want to read it to you. Um, and I want you to remember, no, I don't think it's on there. Um, and I want you to remember our invocation earlier and try and harness that together with this. So the astrologer's oath, according to the Organization for Professional Astrologers, is the infinity of the sky has cohesion. The astral planes reveal a logic to which nature fully resonates and aligns. If you are initiated in this art of interpretation of celestial science with existential meaning, I am one. I recognize the privilege and responsibility to serve humanity as an astrologer. To be the channel between above and below, remain grounded, clear of prejudice, and open-hearted, respectfully, gracefully, truthfully. I pledge to assist those who seek higher guidance, direct them to the space, the time, and the way as depicted in the map of geocosmic cycles. I will enlighten them in the perspective that despite trials and tribulations, their lives are intrinsic to an intelligent cosmic order. These suggestions shall be made to the best of my humble understanding. Whether venerated or depreciated publicly in this task, I shall not falter, aware of the merit of this honorable calling. So we're doing pretty good, I think. I, I mean, it's it's a very flowy and poetic um, oath, but, but I've never taken that oath before, and I bet most people who read charts haven't, and it might be something to sort of have available to yourself to really kind of think of these things Despite trials and tribulations, their lives are intrinsic to an intelligent cosmic order. That's kind of our first goal, is to just show them that, right? If we can do that, then we've succeeded in something. Um, so that's the astrologer's oath. Um, now, we're, we're still within this sort of um, territory of talking about ethics in regards to client interaction. But I also want to talk about ethics in regards to interaction specifically with the system itself. Um, Horary, in horary astrology, so horary is a branch of astrology um, that was a lot more popular, I would say, in the Middle Ages. Um, the, the reason why I would say this is only because there are massive volumes dedicated to it. We have no idea, right, um, what was actually happening. But but if we look at textual evidence, it was pretty popular art. Um, and, and people were, were actually like succeeding in making money doing it and stuff. So horary is when you cast a chart for a question. It's sort of like a tarot reading or a casting of the runes. 
Um, and in this sort of um, middle age, the <laughs> middle age, in the Middle Ages, when horary astrology was becoming very popular, there were two authors who actually wrote um, what they called their considerations, William Lilly and Guido Bonatti. And in their considerations, they basically described situations in which the chart itself, the cosmos, the gods, whoever it is you are talking to, is saying, this answer doesn't work. This question doesn't work. This client has come to you, they're lying to you, right? And so you should not answer this question. It will actually cause you defamation. I mean, these are the things that are said in some of these considerations. Now, in the modern world, right, as astrologers, how do you even begin to fit something like that into an actual practice? If, if someone comes to you and something is off and the system is telling you or the gods are sending you messages that you shouldn't respond or you shouldn't answer this question or you shouldn't do this reading, how do we begin to sort of bring that into how we actually practice on a day-to-day -day basis with people? Um, and how do we begin to trust that as well? Like, that's a, a, a hard call to make is I have a human sitting in front of me and yet this sort of language that I know is telling me conflicting information. And so leaning into our trust of the system and our awareness of that divine sort of word, I think this is where things get really potentially tricky and kind of heavy. Um, because if you really did think you were talking to God, you wouldn't question it, right? <laughs> you would just know this is the answer. And so do we build those things in to an astrological practice? And if so, what does that even begin to look like on a practical level, like with a client interface? I imagine therapy might, therapists might have some answers because I assume things like that would come up um, in therapeutic contexts as well. So perhaps that can be something we discuss. Um, okay, we can move to the next point. So extending now from um, our individual ethics to our sort of client ethics um, up into to sort of community ethics, uh, which for me is, is really going to be based kind of around astrological education, um, but, but there's more to it than that. Um, so uh, his point number 14, we're back to Maternus here, do not entrust the secrets of this religion to the sinful greed of men's minds, for one should not initiate souls of depraved men into the holy rituals. This divine science cannot at any time adhere to a mind captured and stained by wicked greed, and it always sustains the greatest loss when it is defamed by improper intentions. So, point number 14. We're starting to talk about community now. Um, I just want to point out again. One should not initiate souls of depraved men into the holy rituals. So, we're kind of at an interesting moment in time, right? Um, I imagine that at least half of the people in this room in, in some form of um, social media or another came across some very interesting news pieces over the last couple of weeks, maybe the last month or so, about the number of witches in America. Um, I'm going to read a couple of uh, excerpts from this article in Newsweek that was just published on, on the 18th of November. The number of witches and Americans practicing Wicca religious rituals increased dramatically since the 1990s, with several recent studies indicating that there may be at least 1.5 million witches across the country. From 1990 to 2008, Trinity College ran three large detailed religion surveys. They estimated um, that there were 8,000 Wiccans in 1990 and that there were 340,000 practitioners in 2008. And then now 10 years after that, we're at 1.5 million, presumably. Um, one, uh, uh, one of the people who was involved in the um, poll, poll, the survey, said, it makes sense that witchcraft and the occult would rise as society becomes increasingly postmodern. The rejection of Christianity has left a void that people, in, as inherently spiritual beings, will seek to fill. Um, this is what author Julie Royce said. And then she says, plus, Wicca has effectively repackaged witchcraft for millennial consumption. <laughs> no longer is witchcraft a paganism, satanic and dem demonic. It's a pre-Christian tradition. This is in quotes, right? Pre-Christian tradition that promotes free thought and understanding of earth and nature. I don't necessarily disagree with any of that, but I do want to point out that it's actually been here for a long time and that... Our world, although it's becoming increasingly postmodern, astrology has always played a really critical part in it, which just didn't just appear with the postmodern age because the Christian church is unsatisfying. Astrologers existed before Christianity, they existed alongside it, and they're going to exist after it. And so I want to just sort of point out that even though we have this rise in witchdom, witchhood, witchcraft, um, witches, um, it's not that something is lacking 
that brings us out. Like we're here regardless. Um, and that's really powerful to think about because then we are, we're not going anywhere too. I think that's a good way to think about it. Um, but so that's just, just to kind of put that out there. But what I want to know is like, how do we educate all of these new witches, right? Because there's new witches and they're like Dorothy. They just landed in Kansas and they don't even know they're witches or maybe they do and they're just discovering it, but, but they need guidance. Um, so one of the ways that a lot of people are getting educated with astrology nowadays is social media. Um, and we're gonna have a little comic relief for a moment. So if you could go to the next slide, please. So astrology memes are a thing. <laughs> Can everybody see this one? <laughs> so this is a mock Google search. It's been highly photoshopped and edited. And it's Google search Scorpio. And the, the Google search engine says, did you mean a cancer, but with trust issues? And it's very funny, ha, huh? if you know anything about astrology, it's kind of, you know, accurate, maybe. I don't know if you believe in signs. It's a, it's a funny play on the reality of, of an intense emotional sort of water sign. And then the next one. Hell, Michigan is a real town, by the way. Hell, Michigan? It really is. Did it say it was Where from Hell, Michigan? Where they were reporting yeah. from. Yeah, that's, real, that's an actual <laughs> town. Um, OK, and then this is another one. Meeting someone with Pluto in the first house, and you guys probably can't read it, but it says, they warned me Satan would be attractive. <laughs> right? OK. OK, but are these ethical? Our astrology means I love them, and I laugh at them all the time. But are they ethical? Are we really putting out information? that speaks to authenticity. So what I want to obviously point out is that they are hilarious. And to what extent does comedy play a role in fixing so many ills, right? And so many of our sufferings, so many of our own self-identification issues, so many of the problems with the world, done in the right way, comedy can be immensely therapeutic. And so I, I'm, I'm not stating anything one way or the other. I just want to sort of point out that, that there are these other worlds that are happening. And this is, this is one of them. People are being educated and also really learning certain nuances that you couldn't really learn from an astrology book. Um, so there is value to it, for sure. Um, so I guess I just sort of want to point out that like we, right, all in this, in this room, maybe beyond this room, um, definitely beyond this room, but I'm going to speak to us in here. We really do kind of have a responsibility to honor our lineage, um, both by sort of educating ourselves in it um, but then also by educating clients and students. Um, I think our lineage is everything. Uh, the men, and then of course the unnamed women, right, who nurtured and cared for the wisdom of astrology over the centuries, they literally risked everything. I don't think that we can even conceive of what it was like to carry an astrological text across, you know, the desert of Byzantium in the seventh century. I mean, it's terrifying. Your life was literally at stake. And people really were exiled. Exiled, can you imagine? I don't even know what that means. I mean, right now, I'd love to be exiled from America. But <laughs> burned. They were burned at the stake. They were murdered. They were manipulated. Are we honoring their legacy when we create an astrology meme? Maybe. I'm, I'm poking fun at these on purpose. But it's an important question. Do we recognize our privilege in the modern world as being able to touch this information without the fear of being literally burned at a stake? I mean, these are huge things. And then how do we actually honor that when we engage with the material, when we engage with clients, when we discuss the potential of someone's future? Are all of those people standing behind us, right? Or are we forgetting about them? And if they are standing behind us, how are we bringing them in to the material that we're sharing, that we're learning? So, so closing remarks is one more slide. Scooch, scooch. <laughs> Point 15. So this is the last of his points in just, you know, and then he goes on to write a whole book after this. But therefore, be pure and chaste. And if you have separated yourself from all kinds of wicked activity which destroy the spirit, and if the desire for the right way of life has freed you from any suspicion of crime, and if you conduct yourself as one mindful of the divine seed, capitals, approach this work and commit to memory the following books, the books that he's writing. In this way, having attained the true knowledge of this divine art, when you calculate the destinies of men and chart the course of their lives, you will be directed not only by your readings, but also by the conclusions of your own reasoning. Thus, your own divinely inspired ideas may be of more profit to you than the traditions of the written word. 
so do we all have to study only the history of astrology and only do historical astrology and that's just the way that it is? Um, do we have to be serious? Is there like no room for fun in any of this? I really think that this idea of the divinely inspired, our own divinely inspired ideas can be more of profit to us, but, but only after you've learned, right? Um, that at some point you will have to sort of shed that past and that the fun can really kind of come in and that the astrology memes can be really meaningful, but only if you're very aware and have looked back and understand all of the sacrifices that have been made and all of the beauty that has gone into the forming of this wonderful world that you get to play a part in, um, then you can be free. Then your divine inspiration will have more weight than that text from a thousand years ago. But if you don't know that text, you're standing on faulty ground. So do we really believe in what we do? I, I kind of alluded to this earlier. Is it even possible for us to believe it to the extent that we recognize that the words that we utter do have the power to make or break someone's life? Of course we don't think that way, but maybe we should. How might we engage with our art, with our clients, with the broader community of the world if we believed that the stars really did decree a fate and that we as astrologers are able to see it? Perhaps if we emphasize the bigness of what we do, we would be more careful with it. Um, I'd love to respond a little bit and then I'll let other people chime in. Um, but so there's there's a couple things and um, and I fully agree, like there's just differences. And the more that I um, study divination and shamanism across the world, the more I realize that there's like literally almost nothing really in common with any of these systems that we apply these labels to. And so even within what you would call a witch is radically different within each individual cultural context. We still have to talk about it and so i do sort of just like we can be a little bit liberal as long as again it's that similar thing as long as we know then we are allowed to sort of break that rule right um because then you can say yes yes that's that's a rule and the reason why i have to break it in this context is such but um 
I think that one of the problems with the separation of astrology and witches, and especially perhaps even thinking in, in traditions like um, like in the East with um, uh, Jyotish or Vedic astrology, astrology actually hasn't always been totally separated from magic. And I think that astrology becomes separated from magic as a result of these various types of oppression historically, which made astrologers say, no, oh, no, I don't practice alchemy. I don't touch plants. I don't do any of that. All I do is look at the stars. And somehow that made them safer. But you can look back at the history of astrology, and they've been witches all along. There are some of the earliest texts that we have about gemstones and about herbal remedies were associated with astrological plants, at least within the European Western tradition. Um, and again, the term witch, yes, that's the closest thing I can come to from my historical lineage as a European, um, you know, with European ancestry. But, and so it is sort of tricky to figure out, like, how do we, how do we name the common theme that, that some of these figures, various cultures share without, you know, diminishing each of their individual uniqueness, without sort of cultural appropriation. Um, and, and I think that the best thing is to just state your own, this is where I come from, right? I am this one. Like, oh, that's very similar to what you are. What is your experience of it? And to sort of find where you meet and to find. And for me, the best way that I've been able to guide myself in communicating with shamans of traditions that I am not of is to just say, well, this is me and this is what I do. And these are my traits. And then they can say, well, this is me and this is my name and this is what I do. And these are my traits. And, and so you can see that there's a mingling. There's a similar habitation of a, of a realm, right? It's not always maybe the most visible or um, the most accessible to, to the average set of skills and brains, um, set of brains. Um, but, but so, so yeah, and I fully agree with all of that. And yet I do think that it's, it's okay as long as you know as long as you know the depth of a tradition, it's okay to, to communicate in a way that starts to build those bridges. And I think if we shy too much away from, from direct communication because we're scared, um, then we're not going to learn anything. And that's the, the biggest sort of tragedy that we can have, um, is, is to be too scared, really, of, of offending somebody that we're not going to learn from them. And so sometimes you have to sort of be willing to be um, a little bit risky in that regard specifically. Um, but I do really, really believe that that there is more similarities to witches and astrologers than um, than we tend to think, and and that's a whole other topic of conversation. Looking at you know the wonderful traditions of Western magic, um, and then also looking at how astrology has been related to ritual and medicine and plants and trees and um, gemstones and everything uh, in the East as well, because the tradition doesn't seem to have lost so much of its magical witchy connotations. Um, as it does, as it has in the West. Um, so, yeah, please. Only a very quick response to that. I think the Vedic or the Sanskritized streams of astrology would be the first one to other the, the witches. Yeah. The, Can you say the more? Witch, the witches, the figure of the witch would live more in the folk consciousness of right. indigenous witches, which yeah. is India rather than in the Vedic. Right. Well, and that's an interesting thing that we, you know, can kind of think about too, is we don't even have much access to our indigenous cultures anymore and so we don't even know how to engage with them right and so that's that's one of the problems of of the west's you know mentality of conquering is that we don't even get that opportunity and so it's fascinating to hear you say this because i do know that yodish has a societal place and so i wonder if that would happen here but we'll, we'll never know that right because we don't we don't even have any indigenous people to ostracize any longer because we've killed them all at least in the new world um, and in europe there's similar problems so um, so that's a wonderful perspective and something I would never know. I have no, I've never been to India, and I, you know, so I thank you for, for calling that out and bringing it here because there's truth in that. Um, sad truth, but truth nonetheless, yeah. Are you speaking of indigenous people to North America or to like the European, like? I was speaking nations? primarily to North America. I mean, and obviously we haven't killed them all. It's, yeah, I'm being very, to very, name very that many of them. But I, many of them are absolutely still here. And yeah, I think that that's important. But I don't want to lose the loss. I don't want to, I mean, horrible, the extent of, of, of loss um, is such that I think it's important to be able to say, like, I mean, especially cultural loss, land loss, animal loss, like we've, we've really done a number on it. And so, of course, there's still seeds and of course, there's still living traditions. And that's a, a beautiful thing. And I 100% like we should be nurturing that. But we also t took over in a really aggressive and dominant way. It's really unfortunate.
Um, so, but yes. <laughs> More than anything, that they're not like an extinct. No, right. Uh, <laughs> yeah. No. And and but there are what are there tribes. the social structure of a sort of dominant culture and then violate that to be considered a witch. If you were indigenous, you weren't even on the table. You were just so far down um, in, in regard. So um, the, the indigenous witch is a, it's another wonderful, fascinating topic that I'd love to go into more. <laughs> Thank you for naming that. So um, okay, anybody else have thoughts about ethics? Client ethics, self ethics? Yes, I just wanted to comment. First of all, thank you for your talk. Yep. It was wonderful. Thanks. And when you were talking about the power within the words, like if we really think about okay. the divine coming through, it made me think of Tillman talking about like returning the angelology to the word in revisioning. And that idea of like our language being so fraught with the like with economics and um, technology. And so like for when you're talking about the ethics and giving to your clients, just thinking about how that's delivered in terms of maybe like that that languaging that's so permeated in our culture and um, just thinking about the words, I appreciated you bringing that up because I think it's so hard these days in our communication to take out that vernacular of economics and technology right. from our language. Yeah. Well, and I would say historically that was always known and so you'll have like ancient greek astrologers using hebrew to call in certain deities where it's like they you know where there was a known reality of of the sort of the profanity or the profaneness right of, of common lingua franca and so you would harken back to this sort of other dead language to call in your deities because otherwise you would be yeah, tainting um the material and so um i don't know maybe we can all learn greek now <laughs> But just, you know, there, there's a, a reality to that. Um, and I think it means choosing words very carefully. And I think it means being less wordy. Um, I know I'm a very wordy person, but when I teach astrology, I try to use a couple of words. And I think that the more streamlined we can make our vocabulary, the better it is going to be for us to be able to impart information and then let the, the client or the person sort of naturally constellate around that rather than telling them, too many of the ways in which these things can come out. Um, because yeah, language is, is tricky. Um, so um, I think Aaron was, someone over here was before. Let's let Aaron go first. Um, I, hi, thank you, this is great. I really appreciate the, uh, the text that you're working from here. I wanted to make some observations about it. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of talk here about the importance of doing things publicly. And also the word seem. I don't know the Latin. Seem. Um, it'd be nice if we had facing Latin. I know. Nice time to do this. Seem or seem? Seem shows up many times right. in these yeah. points. Um, there's a, there's a, quite a concern about how it seems. Um, and so I can only imagine that that speaks to a specific climate. The four of the 15 points are about how you handle discourse about the emperor. Yeah. Um, so I just wanted to point that out. Well, that's uh, and something if, interesting about this text. Yeah. And if we know, if, if any of you are, are up to date on your astro uh, on your classics history, um, Constantine was actually the Roman emperor who outlawed all pagan religion. So this guy was writing right at that moment in history where finally an emperor said, no, nope, Christianity is it, and anybody who believes otherwise is out. Literally, like you're exiled, you're not a Roman citizen, you're, you're screwed. And so it's, I mean, so that is a huge, like, yeah, the political climate was fully sort of contained within this. Um, and that also might be a, a, a reason for that emphasis on this divine sort of quality of it, right? Like, this is important. We're, we're just communicating some sort of godly thing. Um, 
but yeah, so I just want to sort of point that out. Like, yeah, it was serious at that moment. Yeah, so it's interesting <laughs> about how we make astrology seem to, yeah. to, to mm-hmm. its others. Right, and Ptolemy commented on it. Astrology was never widely accepted. I mean, it was, it was accepted, but people have always had complaints about it. I mean, people from the first century, second century, they've always been like, oh, I don't know. <laughs> and you can read, like, even in the beginning of Ptolemy's Tetrapicos, he has to make a case for it. Um, everybody's always having to make cases for their astrological art. So um, there is a, a sense that it's always been kind of on the fringe, even yeah. though uh, even though it's, it, astrology is weird in that it's somehow mostly been on the fringe, and yet it's often been very popular, and yet it's often been at the seat of power, but it's almost like nobody really talks about it. Right, or they, everybody has the same narrative, even though it's it permeates all corners. Um, so, yeah. well, I wanted to suggest that um, toward a uh, some kind of definition of of a witch. Yeah. Um, I'm just thinking out loud, but it seems like a witch is someone who seeks power, at least of a certain kind, and then deploys that power, um, and that would be, I think, typically in the form of, let's say, a spell, right? And so this gets to your discussion about the use of language. There's some sense in which the astrologer is always casting a spell. An astrological description or interpretation is a spell cast. And so I, I just think that... Or it can be. I, I guess I thought I heard you suggesting that it is. Necessarily. I was suggesting that perhaps we should think of it as... Yeah, well, I, I agree with you on yeah. that. I think astrology is a form of magic yeah. in that sense. Mm-hmm. So it is creative. I mean, I I do think of it, I think it has the potential to be incredibly powerful, but the, I mean, to, to go into that kind of conversation would be like into very sort of philosophical territory about the reality of linguistics and what language is and what it means and what it does to human consciousness and the makeup of the human brain and our sort of neural patterns. Um, and I think it, it, you know, I think that, yeah, I think, I think, it, I think it is personally. But I don't. I don't want to say that that's universal. You know, I don't want to say that it, it has to be. Um, and I don't want to say that what I have to say about astrology is is any more valid than what someone else has to say about it. And so I do think that there's room um, for someone to absolutely refute that and say, "Hell no, it's not a spell. It's a psychological exercise. It's no more a spell than." God, the thought that came to my mind was the Pledge of Allegiance, but that was not a good example. <laughs> <laughs> it's that's it's very hard much to so. find counterpoint. <laughs> But yeah, I mean, I think that there is a spell-like quality to a reading. Um, it's definitely enchanting. I will say that you are absolutely you as the astrologer, as the conduit, are enchanted by what you're getting from the material, and the person is ra- radically enchanted by what you are sharing to them. And so there is it's a it's a weird magical sort of cauldron that happens um, during any kind of astrological activity. And so spell, maybe yeah, why not? So in Tibetan context, you Laura. Were... Oh, Brian wants to jump in. Okay, okay, sorry, yelling. Sorry, sorry. sorry. <laughs> Brian's so much fun stuff to talk about. Brian's going to. You better be quick, because Lily Falconer was definitely next. Nice. Lily, <laughs> go ahead. Thanks, Brian. It's actually on the topic of language too. So um, I think of astrology as a type of a language. Yeah. Uh, it's probably a divine language. Um. And so uh, in that vein, the question of readiness, and have you studied the language thoroughly enough, including its history, its present context and usage, when have you studied the language thoroughly enough to tra- to start translating the text of a chart? Mm-hmm. And have you studied the language thoroughly enough to translate um, the language for a class to teach students? And all of the, those kinds of questions, the readiness around it, if we could speak of it as a language. I also have a comment about the word spell, which I think has a nefarious <laughs> uh, connotation. Um, and so I would, I would maybe draw on some other words to flush out what the word spell means in that. Like invocation. Or maybe to it, but, but yeah, language and readiness for translating and interpreting and 
Well, and I'll, I'll, we have Sabrina and then Brian, but just to sort of comment on that, um, in the Hellenistic astrological tradition, one particular scholar um, who translated a lot of ancient astrological material, Robert Schmidt, he fully believed that astrology was a language. And when you learn um, Hellenistic astrology, it's very, you, you have to phrase things in a very specific way. And the chart was read as though you specific words about a planet with a very specific um, grammatical uh, sort of phrase to denote what house it was in and how that affected the way that it manifested um, and then how that affected the aspects that it was making and all of these were like very meticulous phrases and grammar and so even within the, the tradition itself there is absolutely um, room to kind of show how it was a language and it was it was very meticulous in the way that it was communicated um, because of this this reality that it, that it did have a kind of invocation process. Um, now I'd love to talk more about spell versus invocation but let's hear more and then we can maybe come back to it. Sabrina. Um, thank you for this. It sparked a few thoughts. Um, I think the social media astrology is like a symbol of the democratization of astrology. Yeah. And I feel that um, in a culture where the astrologers hold a lot more knowledge about astrology than the general public, there's a lot more power and responsibility placed on that astrologer. But I think a move towards greater ethics in the world of astrology is about education and helping people understand astrology better, understand their own charts better, understand how to interact with transits so that um, there's not all of this projection onto the astrologer. Yeah. So like, I mean, because I've always, and I, you can tell me if I'm misunderstanding you, but I've always wanted to be an astrology teacher, not an astrologer. That's like from day one, I really quickly realized, like, I don't want to tell people about themselves. I want to teach them this language, you know, and that was something that I've obviously been following for many years now. Um, but do you, is that kind of what you're sort of alluding to as well? Is like really teaching people to see astrology rather than to just receive it? Right, and I like to do both, like I readings and teach, but I think that um, if you're going to be giving a reading to someone, like my personal like, ethic on it that I can just kind of articulate right now is to help someone connect to themselves rather than prescribing someone something um, that they wouldn't connect to or that's just kind of imposition upon them. Yeah, I like that, and that, I really love the way maternus sort of alludes to that like just go slow right like if you see their vices like you don't need to just spit it out at them like just have a little bit of like restraint and then it'll naturally come out and i do think that that's a really good way to kind of like show people into themselves um and sometimes if you just take one step at a time you're less likely to falter you know go the wrong way um Brian Swim, are you ready? <laughs> I'm only a Sabrina. I'm done. Thank you. I have a personal question. Yeah. Is, that Is it a person about yourself? Do we need okay. a chart? Right. Or? <laughs> you. Oh, yeah. Okay, go ahead. You ready? Yeah. Okay. I, I've always been fascinated by uh, what convinces us to enter into a um, framework of interpretation. And I think one of the more powerful ways is, is what you're talking about, ethics. But we're really impressed. I'm impressed that you would even bring up that. It says something really important in hearing this gentleman's um, views. Because it's um, inspiring, right? I, I had a very, I was stuck in uh, Utah State University when I was a child, and I had a very low opinion of Mormons. Until I found out that Steve Young <laughs> was Mormon. <laughs> Right. I mean, like, it's just amazing when he was retiring. Um, when he, if this is not a side issue. When he's retiring, in the room, there were people that wanted to kill each other. Right? But they so wanted to be there with him because he was so amazing. But from that moment on, I thought Mormonism was the real thing. Right? Um, so I mean, I'm curious as to how... Uh, you were drawn into astrology in terms of ethics. For instance, were you, did you come across um, some astrologers that just really impressed you with their integrity? Well, I mean, like I said. No, don't refer to Rick. That'd be but, too but that was, I, mean, I, told, I said that in the beginning of the lecture. Did you, did you hear that? I was that? there for that. Um, <laughs> 
<laughs> but but he but but to, but to, to give credit where it's due, at that point I had read hundred astrology books. I had had teachers. I had seen. I had been to conferences. I knew what was out there, and what he was doing was not being done, right? And so there's we're we're going back to lineage, right? Like yeah. and and I don't. I mean, we might as well ask at some point what what inspired Rick to start thinking about these I would things. Love to. Um, because that's that that would have been that was for me where it was like this is different. This is different than what's available out there, and I like this, and this is resonates with me, and this is important well, to was me. Was it different because of the ethical dimension? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Very specifically because of the ethical Word. dimension. Um, very, but but also, I mean, you, you know, Rick's work is comprehensively yeah. fantastic, and so it's easy to get. But but there was something about that that made me feel like we have a duty, right, and that we have a duty to ourselves to to sort of take on this mantle, um, and then we have a duty to do it right, uh, and that. But, but so that, that would be the, the, the entry. But what really sort of solidified it for me was studying the history of astrology and realizing what was at stake and what was at stake for so many people and how intensely they contended with these issues. I mean, I, the first time I read this was probably like in 2004 or something. And so this has been part of my astrological experience the whole time is just trying to understand like how. What does it mean to be an astrologer? Really, what does it mean? And what have astrologers thought about this for the last couple of thousand years um and so so there was so there was two fold for that for me where it was it wasn't just you know the spark of inspiration but but there was this sort of follow-through and this experience and a realization of how big and beautiful this tradition is and wanting to i, I mean basically i really wanted to know everything that's like literally the answer is i just want to know all of it <laughs> and so ethics is part of it <laughs> is, that, is that is that the answer yeah. okay <laughs> um, I think you're now next. Yeah, I don't think anybody was pending. Um, something that has been coming to mind through all of this is the role of community and learning astrology. And astrology really is a way of life. When you start learning it, it, it's not like you take it kind of into a professional direction that you're an astrologer from nine to five, and then evening comes and you aren't anymore. Um, it, it's in every conversation, um, and it comes up when you meet strangers, and they immediately, you know, want to know about their chart about themselves. I was thinking about this the other day that, um, you know, someone says uh, I'm a dentist. The immediate response is, "Oh, can you work on my teeth right now?" <laughs> <Woke it up>. <laughs> um, <laughs> but we do get that question, um, and. <laughs> I've been thinking about, in terms of ethics, what role the community plays um, versus learning astrology as a more isolated individual or secretly, like a lot of teenagers learning um, astrology in, um, kind of more secretly or in isolation or something like that versus um, in a community such as this one. And I think that the social media does play a big role because you can find that community online I thought you said supervision. 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 <laughs> yes. Supervision, supervision and supervision. That's <laughs> yeah. um, not a whole cool idea for an organization. <laughs> <laughs> um, but so that we can check our practices with each other. And I also, as Aaron brought up, appreciated this piece around doing things publicly. And there is, in a private practice sense, the important element of confidentiality, right. which is the inverse of that in some ways. But even as you're holding confidentiality, you need to be able to check those practices or that material. In general, I want to bring that to you and right. the community. Well, on that. so I hit that, I kind of laid out, I was hoping that I was going to lay out more of them, but I had that first sort of like ethical rule for self practice. Um, and it was like, you wouldn't do or say this to a client, don't do or say it to yourself. And I was trying to, I had envisioned something about um, community and um, kind of, I've kind of forgotten what, what I was actually going to say just now. Um, you were talking about 
communities. What's the last part of what you were saying? I know. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I said a lot of things. Uh, uh, something like super privacy and public. There we go. Thank you. Like, I just public. lost it. Checking. Okay, yeah. so even though, so here's our, our ethical rule for clients or maybe community. Thank goodness we're here. Um, so our, <laughs> our community rule would be, or, or, or sort of uh, as ethical rule for a client engagement would be, I wouldn't say in public, but don't say in public because you're having to be in a confidential environment. But, but that might be something to think about too, is like where, you know, because there is, I really did appreciate that too, because that's not something that we often talk about is like how comfortable are you with what you're saying to somebody and what what is available and um, and what do they ask you you know do it in the light of day so that they don't ask you something that you shouldn't answer uh, these are really interesting concepts and so that was something i had thought of was like well you know you should be able to say and you, you shouldn't be embarrassed if your reading recording somehow makes it onto the web right <laughs> you shouldn't be embarrassed of that it would be a, a breach but but we should feel confident in what we're saying, and we should know that what we're saying holds the holds up to the test of other astrologers. If another astrologer hears it, they're like, oh, "I might have said something different, but yeah, that makes sense." Um, those are the sorts of things that that if we can kind of connect in that area, then I think that um, then we can start to like build yeah a bigger sort of ethical community and, and find similarity and um, sort of ground that we can stand on together. And then just one yeah. follow up thought is the importance of astrologers giving each other readings, yeah. um, not just giving astrologer to client, but astrologers to each other. Yeah. Well, and that solves the problem of using yourself as a guinea pig for yeah. your learning new astrology. Your astrology friends. Um, any other thoughts? Ari? Thank you so much. You're welcome. What a joy. Um, I've been thinking lately about uh, spiritual gurus who act really badly <clears throat> right just how rampant that is and like it, the feeling is that I have is that like right you can sort of promulgate all like the ethical rules that you want but if there's things inside us that aren't cooked that we haven't like grappled with in an honest and you know way full of integrity the chances of it leaking out are like a hundred percent and so and it makes me wonder about like an ethics for astrology. It's not about like here's 15 rules, but like do the work. Yeah. And it's it's amazing that astrology can actually be a tool for that. Um, but what I see in like in our professors in this department is that that like that work is happening. Right. And, um, and I think that's the core of the ethics, or that of what makes me feel like trustworthy. Yeah. Um, and so I wonder how we address that because it's not something that you can diagram or adjudicate or you know write out. I mean, how do we? How I'm, do we I'm envisioning like an astrologer's website that like specializes in Saturn transits. You know, like I've been through all of yeah. them, and so I can guide you through this. And I mean, there's a, a, a sort of jest in that, but there's also a like, yeah, like to what extent have you been through more? And and in, in some ways, there's really just passage of time, right? Like astrology is all about time. And sometimes it really is just like years and years. And and, and if you're doing it for years and years, you've experienced more of the archetypes. And, and then, you know, but but to sort of, and that's why for me, like, I mean, I, I don't know if everybody in this room knows, but, but I've obviously been very much a proponent of, of like degrees in astrology. Like if you just, you just need to be in it for years and then you will have learned something. And it's not even information. It's that space for transformation of self. It's that space for letting it work on you um, and then working with it and then being able to get to a point where you can say something about it. Um, so that's sort of been my, that's my just like band-aid solution. Like everybody just needs a degree <laughs> and that's why we have schools for it, you know? And I know that that's not um, a general consensus or, or a sort of solid response, but that's my response very specifically to me. Um, but I would love to hear it to those sorts of things. And I do think that there's truth in that. You do need to have done some work or been worked on, whatever it is. Either way, it's kind of like massage where you have to receive them and really like feel that kind of pass through you before you can actually like pass that through somebody else. Um, yeah, I don't know. 
I was going to say that's another it's another good reason for community because there's always going to be people who are drawn to the power of telling people about themselves. <laughs> Let me tell you about you, you know. And there's there's always going to be people who are drawn to that from a place of avoidance, right? But in community, that pattern can be recognized by a community and held or called out or then like be like, this isn't working. Actually, this has happened with this person, this person, this person, and it's not yeah. working anymore. And so that's one of the important things about community um, and doing things, being seen, you know, um, in public, in public, right? Um, or, or saying things to people that they could uh, say again in public or something like that, you know, rather than whispering in the corner, uh, kind of keying into somebody's major complex or something and whispering something to them in the corner that totally, because you know, because you know their chart. And I've seen people do that, I and mean, I've had people do that to me, um, and I've seen it happen. And then I've also seen community say enough. And so that's important, you know, really crucial. <clears throat> yeah, Mindy. Um, I found myself feeling a little resistant to the way he presents, you know, what you should do, what you should do, what you should do. And, and from my um, upbringing in Christianity, um, which I outgrew um, I was about 20, um, what my face is this tendency to kind of um, tie together like morality and practice, like or, or spiritual practice. And I know that makes sense, but at the same time, I think there are two different things. And that they have an innate knowing around morality that, that nobody has to teach us. And, and so I really like that we got in the secular, you know, the, the comedy, right. um, because, you know, I, I, I think everything is sacred and everything is magic, you know, but, but to make space for that, you know, is, is really important and it doesn't speak to, I, I don't think it has to speak to morality or ethics. I think it's, it's, you know, it should have its own space. Yeah. And I think that, you know, as I was sort of saying, this is a lot of what I've had to contend with in my dissertation, um, is it, because divination specifically is very different than astrology. And it, and it really, you can't add morality. Like if you're just reading an I Ching parable, like you just, you do the steps and then you read it and then you just offer it. Um, and you don't worry about what the person makes of it. You don't worry about where it triggers them. Yet, in fact, the symbolic associations are kind of part of it. And so, so it's it's interesting because that's something that astrology can do. You could easily, as an astrologer, just spit out what came from what you were reading, um, and not concern yourself with those things. Um, and I don't know. I, I mean, I don't. The morality of it is very is very heavy, and obviously, I mean, this is like outdated. We need to be updating a little bit, um, but but I, I I don't know. I tend to be I tend to be in theory a should person and in praxis not at all. And so I, I have that interesting sort of uh, conundrum within myself where I'm like, yes, all of this, we should be like this. But then when it really comes down to it, I, I have a much sort of softer approach in general. Um, and so I think I think yeah. But if we strive for that, or if we have that as like a background then maybe we'll be able to sort of reconnect with that inherent morality that we do know within ourselves. But if we fully let go, I, I, I don't necessarily trust everybody to fall back in a moral state that is the same as mine, right? So if we have a sort of high stance like that, you know, right? if you um, shoot for the moon, if you miss, you'll end among the stars. Or it's like, we don't need to do this. But if we at least sort of strive for something, then maybe we'll be a little bit more close to each other than if we don't. Yeah, I wasn't suggesting we don't strive right. for it. <laughs> Not at all. Yeah. But I do think everything is magic. <laughs> Thanks. Um, anyone else? Sabrina? Yeah. Um, I'm making a connection.
connection between what you were talking about with therapy or like psychology and are you bringing in like stuff not being cooked and not leaking out? Um, I wonder if the, the moral standards that um, to ancient astrology are like psychological standards to modern astrology. Well, and I think that's a, a really safe kind of parallel to make, especially considering the ways in which astrology was used were far less psychological, right? Like it was more astrologers were talking about the emperor. I mean, there's plenty of astrologers talking about come now, but I think that it, it was it was used a lot in these sort of social contexts. And so it makes sense that your morality and your code of ethics would be um, applied to this sort of sense of, of, of how this affects the general public. Now astrology um, in the postmodern sort of time has really become aligned with psychology way more than it ever was in any sort of historical context. And so, yes, I do think that, that, that that's a, a very fair statement to make and that by, so, so that our code of ethics does need to look more like that, the way this looks more like the code of ethics for sort of public type of astrology. Um, and, you know, that's not even to say anything about mundane astrology, which is, right, like commenting on what's happening in the world at any given because that's not psychological and that's something that's been with us from the very beginning um and and how that relates to i mean that's a that's a whole other sort of ethical consideration of like if we're making pronouncements about an entire community of humans like a globe of humans and what they're going through at any moment and and the sort of fear inducing and panic and panic stricken sort of things that can come about from there so i think that that would also require its own very special set of of considerations, just considerations. And I think that's what's so interesting about the fact that that's the way sort of Lily, William Lilly and Lito Bonatti sort of phrased it was it's like, we're not saying don't do this. We're just saying, think about this when this is in the chart. And what does that say about how you're gonna interpret it and what you can do from there? Um, so yeah, multi-layers. Anyone else? So, oh, well, one other thing I just wanted to sort of bring up I mean, Matt and you all were supposed to sort of bring some of these things in. We were talking about the ethical witch, and I was asking some of my friends for some advice about what are ethical concerns of witches. And, um, and some of the things that came up, one of them was vegan potions, which we're not discussing here. <laughs> the rights of newts, <laughs> which we're also not discussing here. But I also wanted to sort of bring us into that reality of like, really ethics is, is big and, and being a witch is, is huge. And what are these, what what do we think about when we think of these two things together? Um, magic and, and ethics. Um, and and there's a whole range of ways that these things need to be sort of considered and addressed and manifest in the real world. So, um, but I don't have anything else. If you guys are done, you do that. Oh, oh yeah, I forgot. will you? Okay, so in a month, on January 5th, um, in uh, the East Bay Becca, and Lily and I are actually giving a workshop on astrology, for those who are interested. Um, we're going to be doing a full day workshop, uh, astrology, past, present, and future. So we'll be looking a little bit at historical astrology. Um, presumably, I'll be probably talking about that. And then we'll look at um, sort of current transits and how to look at birth charts and understand them. And then we'll be doing integration techniques and figuring out how to actually live with this information that you have, because sometimes that's right? That's a, a huge ethical component is like, we have all of this wisdom, we know that it's active in our current life, you know, what do we do with it so that it doesn't crush us so that it empowers us. And so we'll be talking about all those things on January 5th, if you guys are interested, um, email me for now, we'll have a flyer and everything posted up at some point soon, but it should be fun. And it's our first coven workshop. So the three of us all together, it's kind of a really big deal. So um, tell your friends. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.